proceed in peace. In the name of Christ, acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and worship, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that St. James Church is built. I welcome you to our patronal festival as we gather to celebrate the life and ministry of this parish. It is wonderful to be able to hold today an orchestral mass and to hear the music of Gabriel Jackson in the mass setting written for our bicentenary. This is the first occasion that it will have been used with an orchestra and so it's a very special occasion for us in many ways. And it's good to see so many of you here. So let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us then run our race, laying aside every weight and bringing our sins to the Lord in penitence and faith. Merciful God, our, our maker and, and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
let us pray. O gracious God, whose apostle James left his father and all that he had, and without delay obeyed the call of your Son, Jesus Christ. Pour out upon the leaders of your church the same spirit of self-denying service by which alone they may have true authority among your people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now I invite all children who are going to kids at church with their parents if they wish to come forward. Children of God, we acknowledge you, and now we send you forth to kids at church. May the scriptures light your way, may God's love fill your hearts with love, and may your lives be marked by hope and joy. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word that the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Barak, son of Neriah, when he wrote these words in a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel to you, O Barak. You said, Woe is me. The Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, I am going to break down what I have built and pluck up what I have planted. That is the whole land. And you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for I am going to bring disaster upon all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in every place to which you may go. For the word of the Lord.
A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. At that time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine over all the world, and this took place during the reign of Claudius. The disciples determined that according to their ability, each would send relief to the believers living in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. And he saw that it pleased the Jews. He proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. For the word of the Lord.
be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. For the Gospel of the Lord. name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Today is our third attempt to perform Gabriel Jackson's Mass of St. James and thus my third attempt to preach this sermon. Although the COVID-19 infection has not gone away, we are at least able to meet again. We have much for which to rejoice. My text from Paul's letter to the Philippians calls us to constant rejoicing. His call is sufficiently important for him to repeat it in the one verse. 
Indeed, rejoicing is a significant theme of this letter, appearing nine times, both in relation to himself and as an instruction to others. The text makes it clear that at the time of writing, Paul is in prison. So rejoicing is to be done regardless of the temporal circumstances. The Greek word translated always, pantote, includes at all times and ever, a broad meaning that does not depend on location or circumstances. When Paul tells the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord always, the word rejoice doesn't just mean feel very happy deep inside. As George Hunsinger says, it's not a matter of elation, but of resilience. Nor is it basically introspective, but Christocentric. The emotion evoked by rejoicing is joy or gladness. Elsewhere, Paul describes joy as one of the fruits of the Spirit. And for Paul, joy is a shared experience, something to have in common with others, particularly the community of faith. Like happiness, joy is not a goal, but a product. It is not a matter of will. You are not joyful because you decide to be. You are joyful because of something else. Indeed, from Paul's perspective, joy is a gift from God. In Romans, he said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And as this morning's psalm says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, then were we like unto them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with joy. A direction to rejoice is appropriate in a period when we're celebrating our bicentenary. We rejoice now because of the inheritance into which we have come in this place. We rejoice for the cloud of witnesses surrounding us here. Our rejoicing does not rest on any perfection in our history. This parish has experienced many troubled times and will do so again. Nevertheless, we rejoice. Our difficult experiences over the past two years do not mean that we cannot and do not rejoice. And all this brings us to Gabriel Jackson's Mass of St. James. As far as I can tell, this is the first Mass commissioned by and for our parish. In that sense, it is particularly our own. In our email communications, Jackson told me that for him, writing music is not about self-expression. He regards himself as an artisan, a maker, using the example of a stonemason. Of course, composing expresses the composer. How could it not? It's a question of intention, of approach. But Jackson's self-deprecating approach should not hide from us his distinguished career as outlined in the program notes provided by Robert Forgush. In his early contact with Warren Trevelyan Jones, they discussed how Australian the mass should be. Given that Jackson has not been here, this question may have raised some difficulties. In any case, it is not an easy question, and I find an answer difficult to imagine. I did not expect echoes of Australian bird calls. This should not be an Antipodean cuckoo and nightingale, the kookaburra and the magpie, as it were. Nevertheless, Jackson said to me, you may hear birds in the woodwinds, even if that was not his intention. We asked Jackson to include a credo, which some contemporary masses omit. He said to me that in the credo, I wanted things to be quite direct and plain speaking almost. It occurred to me afterwards that this might be because I think of Australians as being quite direct. <clears throat> Again, that was not his intention, but his comments remind us that in the Eucharist, 
We are not mere spectators or hearers. We are worshippers and we both bring something to the Mass as well as take something away. Now, too close an adherence to place may not be desirable. Regardless of how an orchestral Mass has come into existence, it remains a liturgical action that must be universally available. It must fill Paul's command to facilitate rejoicing everywhere. And each composition will, of necessity, reflect its time, place and specific purpose, but it cannot be an instrument of exclusion. A Mass must both embody its origin and rise above it. But Jackson did put his imagination to work in what he called oralising the sound of the singers in their space. He also thought about light, bright light and the effect of light on stone as an Australian feature. And that resonates with me. And I imagine that for many of us, our return to Australia from overseas is signalled by the quality of the light in our country. And Jackson translated this accurate perception into lots of bright, high sounds to evoke the idea of light. And hearing the Mass in rehearsal yesterday and this morning, the analogy, it seems to me, is not so much with ordinary daylight as with the brilliance of a cloudless summer midday. Light is a significant Christian theological symbol. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And when in John 9, Jesus heals the blind man, the point of the story is the contrast between those who claim to see and do not, and the blind man who cannot see, but does. Thus, in addition to encapsulating something about Australia, a mass filled with the sounds of light is an analogy for our spiritual lives. Our rejoicing is based on our seeing the light, as it were. Yet it would be a mistake to think that we can experience light without darkness and that darkness is not part of our experience of God. In his essay with the paradoxical title, A Ray of Darkness, Rowan Williams quotes the 17th century poet Henry Vaughan, there is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness. Williams argues that as the light of the world, Jesus does not clear everything up. His light is upsetting, requiring a reworking of myself. William says, in short, when God's light breaks on my darkness, the first thing I know is that I don't know and never did. There is no light without darkness, and the lightness of our mass is thus a challenge to our self-perception. Jackson's sounds of light involved choosing the appropriate instruments given the limitations imposed by our space. In this respect, he evoked the sound of early 19th century orchestras and the Viennese masses at the time of our consecration, prominent wind instruments and small string numbers. Now, such an evocation is one of time only because the early church music of St. James followed the 18th century English parish church style. Standalone services of Holy Communion appeared briefly in the late 1850s and did not reappear until in, introduced by Rector William Carr Smith in 1902. Weekly choral Eucharists, previously a monthly occurrence, did not appear at St. James until 1922 under Philip Micklem. Thus, Gabriel Jackson's Mass celebrates two centenaries, the bicentenary of the parish itself 
and the centenary of our weekly choral Eucharist tradition, which has been interrupted only briefly in the period from 1938 to 1942. In my previous sermons at our contemporary orchestral masses, I've commented on the difference between a concert and a liturgical performance of such a composition. Earlier composers wrote almost only for liturgical occasions and concert performances came much later for those masses. Contemporary composers often write principally for concert performances and may not have imagined their composition in a liturgical environment. On this occasion, which is for a liturgical environment, Jackson tells me he was asked to write music lasting between 35 and 40 minutes. And that meant for him that it would also be suitable for concert performance, evoking a contrast between the public nature of the concert and the more personal nature of the liturgy. Both are in a sense public, but they involve the audience in a different way. A mass in a concert hall or should not trouble us. Music is a universal language and can be heard anywhere. Indeed, taking the mass out of the church is like bringing the world into the mass through the time-honoured form of parody mass, where a popular tune is the basis of the music. Also, Jackson had to produce two versions of his composition, one for orchestra and one for organ. Because the organ works best in blocks of colour, that is how the orchestration had to be conceived, he told me. And one reason, therefore, why we should rejoice today is that Gabriel Jackson, a skilled artisan, has managed with such success to bring together all the requirements placed on him in this commission and to do so from half a world away and without the opportunity to visit us. For that reason, we are able today, in the words of our introit, cantate domino canticum novum, let us sing unto the Lord a new song. In his controversial poem, Leaves of Grass, American Walt Whitman commented on our response to music. He said, all music is what awakens you from when you are reminded by the instruments. It is not the violins and the cornets, it is not the oboe nor the beating drums, nor the notes of the baritone singer singing his sweet romancer, nor those of the men's chorus, nor those of the women's chorus. It is nearer and farther than they. Whitman contrasts the nearness of the music as it is heard and becomes part of us and the distance that it can carry us. This is an appropriate way to encapsulate the importance of music in our liturgical tradition, and particularly in a composition designed to take the canon of the mass, surround us with sound, and lift us into the presence of the divine. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church.
Let us pray for the world and for the church. Shield the church from all ambition and love of power. Give grace to clergy and lay ministers who have been called to change their lives and follow their Lord. Lord, in your mercy, give the spirit of humility to a world where many are seeking for the chief places and for power over others. Bring peace among nations and harmony between races and faiths. Lord, in your mercy, bless us all in our appointed tasks and help us to praise you through faithful work. Be with those who have left their families to begin their own lives and hold them together in the spirit of love. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all those whose ambition has led them into evil ways. We pray for all those whose lives are consumed by envy, that they may find the contentment of loving service. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those of our fellow pilgrims who are sick, Lindsay Beresford, Lisa Slosi, Candace Waters, Barry, Jan McIntyre, Heather Anderson, Ali Crawford, Sister Jeanette Fox, Katie Richardson, Colin Dunstan, Johan Nell, Ruth Jones, Anne Ryan, Elliot, John Gillam, Francis Rolfe, Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who have followed their Lord in this world and in this place and have gone to their rest. We pray for those who have died recently, Herb Anderson, Thea Scott, John Maguire, Derek Alton Priest, Richard Gillard, Barry Hungerford, and for those whose anniversary falls this week, may their place we blessed James and all who have been his disciples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now in union with Christ Jesus. Now in union with Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Yes, you got away with it.
Father, as the saints offer their lives for the sake of the kingdom, receive the bread and wine we offer you in sacrifice. Strengthen our resolve to serve you, that our pilgrimage of faith may lead to the life of eternity. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O oh, glory and honor be yours always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever living God, we give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ who by the power of your spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to a new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks because you have called us into the fellowship of James and all your saints and set before us the example of their witness and the fruit of your spirit in their lives. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing him.
of your creation for this bread and this wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and his blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With whom and in whom in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit we worship you, Father, in songs of never ending praise. <laughs> As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains, which have been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom.
behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
God of courage, we give you thanks for this holy food, and we praise you for your martyr James the Great, who ran with perseverance the race that was set before him, and won the victor's wreath that does not fade. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated? Well, we welcome uh, so many people who have gathered with us for worship today and especially visitors who are with us and those who are online and uh, watching the service today. Uh, I normally have a few notices to give at this point, um, but I only have one today, and that is that there will be refreshments in the crypt after the service, uh, because after Tuesday I don't know what's going on, and <laughs> Father John will take over, and he'll tell you what's going to happen after that, but I think you can find the details in the pew sheet. A uh, few things I do want to say, though, is firstly, Thanks to our musicians, to our orchestra and to our choir. I don't know if Gabriel Jackson is watching us at the moment. I, have a, I suspect he is. And so we can say thank you to him for his uh, wonderful mass setting that we shared in today. There's, there are a few things happening that I should tell you about. This afternoon there is uh, Coral Evensong with the benefactors of St. James, but you're all welcome to come along because it will be my last sermon uh, that I'll be delivering this afternoon. Um, and this is where you get to find out what I really think uh, <laughs> and uh, share that with you, along with all the others who will be coming along. So you'd be most welcome. Uh, and then, of course, tomorrow night... Uh, we, the celebrations go on, and tomorrow night will be uh, St. James Day, uh, Choral Eucharist here in the church, followed by dinner in the covered courtyard, Spanish-themed, and uh, we, I will also be taking leave from my pastoral charge of the parish tomorrow night, so there's a special liturgy of departure. Um, but we won't go into detail. You can find out what it's like if you come along. Um, but there's a feast, that's the important thing afterwards, and uh, this is what St. James does. We enjoy beautiful music, we enjoy gathering together and worshipping God in the beauty of this place, and we enjoy one another and feasting and, and sharing in each other's company as we minister here in the city. And that's one of the important things, I think, uh, in my 12 years here at St. James, it has been a most fascinating and rewarding experience and uh, being in the city it's a very different sort of parish to really any others that you would find uh, in Australia uh, for that matter it, uh, there's probably there are city parishes in many other cities in the world but Australia doesn't have many city parishes like St James and uh, not many people live in this parish but of course I know you will come from all over Sydney from uh, the Blue Mountains, and as far as Gosford, uh, the Shire, uh, and even some from Nowra come up regularly to come and worship here at St. James. So we are spread across the, the length and breadth of uh, the greater Sydney area. And uh, that too, I think, is a part of the fascination of this parish, of bringing so many different people together, different backgrounds, and, uh, and, and different experiences, and we share that together as a community. Uh, it took me seven years for the novelty to wear off being in this place. 
because there's always new things being experienced. And uh, that too is a part of the joy uh, of being at St. James. So uh, I thank you for the responsibility that you gave me, and but you uh, gave me this opportunity to be uh, a part of this parish. Um, along the way, there have been many people who have helped me, and I will probably give a longer speech tomorrow, but simply just say thank you to so many of you who have been supportive, but also been a part of the, the actual mechanics of running this parish. It's large and complex, it's difficult and challenging, and uh, the many lay people in this parish who give of themselves in such a big way uh, to support the parish, uh, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for all of that. Uh, well, where to from here? Rosemary and I will be uh, heading off into the sunset. Well, no, we're actually going up in the morning uh, on Tuesday. Uh, we will move to our property uh, up in the mountains and uh, we will explore new ministries uh, that we will take up uh, after a while of time of quiet rest and reflection and prayer. But uh, finally, I just want to say thank you to Rosemary who has put up with so much uh, in this place and, uh, and my sort of time and, and activities and things that I've been involved in, but she has very, been very supportive. She has a great ministry of hospitality and, uh, and so I just want to acknowledge her. Uh, while the, the wider community of St. James is able to share in that. I might have even said thanks to our daughter Kate, but she has taken her bags and headed off to the airport she's off to the UK this afternoon and uh, she's going to be away for about five weeks um, but it's been wonderful that she's been a part of the life of this parish as well and uh, and so there it is uh, thank you for everything that you have been to for us and uh, you're welcome your hospitality and uh, I'll pray that uh, in time a new rector will come and uh, pick up the next 200 years. Uh, in the meantime, Father John will be the acting rector. I have every faith in him because I know he's done it before. Uh, so, uh, but I'll do a formal handover to him tomorrow night uh, as part of the liturgy of departure. Would you please stand?
who kindled the fire of his love in the hearts of James and all the martyrs and saints, pour upon you the riches of his grace. Amen. May he give you joy in their fellowship and a share in their inheritance. Amen. May he strengthen you on your pilgrimage in the way of holiness, and may you come to the full radiance of glory. Amen. And the blessing of the Most High Life-Giving Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.